This is chapter four, process costing. Job order costing and process costing are two common methods for determining unit product costs. We've already looked at job order costing in a prior chapter. So in this chapter, we're going to explore process costing, but it's good for us still to understand what we learned from job order costing so we can apply some of those costing techniques to this chapter also. So much of what you learn in job order costing um, actually applies to process costing as well. Both systems have the basic same purpose, to assign material, labor, and manufacturing overhead costs to products, and to provide a mechanism for computing a unit cost. Both job order and process costing have the same basic flow of material accounts also. We'll apply our direct materials, our direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead into our work and process accounts. We'll then be able to transfer our work and process to our finished goods. And then when we sell our finished goods, we'll be able to apply the cost of that to an expense account called the cost of goods sold. Same basic flow of cost. Overhead is applied in process costing, just like we applied overhead in job order costing. We used one predetermined overhead rate to apply overhead based on allocation base, like the direct labor cost or direct hours. The clearing and account manufacturing overhead is credited when we actually apply the overhead, and then we put that overhead into our work and process accounts. When we use job order costing, that's the old method. We were looking at very different, unique jobs or products that we worked on within a period, like a, a film set. We we're trying to figure out the cost of a film or creating a, building a cruise ship or very custom-made furniture. They were very unique, different jobs that we could assign costs to. But in contrast, in process costing, it's more used in industries that convert raw materials into homogeneous, uniform products that are produced in a continuous flow of units. They're indistinguishable from one another, like Coca-Cola or garbage bags. It would be very difficult and almost next impossible to assign a work and process account for every bottle of Coke produced. It wouldn't make any sense. So that's how we introduce process costing. Instead of accumulating work and process by job, we will accumulate the cost by processing departments. Now, a processing department is an organizational unit where work is performed on a product and then where materials, labor, and overhead, those three main components, materials, labor, and overhead cost, are added to the product. For example, at our bakery example that we're going to use throughout this video, there are two departments, the mixing department and the baking department. Regardless of the number of departments we discuss, they have two essential features. First, the activity in the processing department is performed uniformly on all the units passing through it. And second, the output of the processing department is homogeneous. In other words, all of the units produced are identical. And products flow in sequence from one department to another. So before we bake, we must start mixing. And then we can move the mixed amount into the department for baking. So a quick check. Process costing is used for products that are A, different and produced continuously, B, similar and produced continuously, C, individual units produced to customer specifications, or D, purchased from vendors. The answer here is similar and produced continuously. Think about Coca-Cola. Every single bottle of Coke is the exact same and is produced continuously. So reviewing back to our basic flow of cost, we apply our three main product costs, direct materials, direct labor, and overhead to work in process. And then when costs are entirely complete, we'll transfer those costs to our finished goods. And from our finished goods, when the actual units are sold, we'll expense it into an account called cost of goods sold. In process costing, we'll apply our work into what we call those departments. The costs are traced and applied to departments, specifically when those departments use the direct labor, direct materials, and overhead. So let's look at how we apply costs based on our financial accounting transactions. Remember our inventory accounts are all assets, so they increase on the left side with a debit. 
and they decrease on the right side with a credit. Raw materials can be applied to any department regardless of the sequence of operations. So in this case, we're going to apply flour to our mixing department and then those baking liners we need for our baking department. See how the raw materials get applied to work and process for both departments, depending on what they use. We will debit or increase the work and process accounts for those uh, departments that use the raw materials, and then we'll credit and reduce our raw materials account. And this is the basic accounting nomenclature set up for debits and credits. Debits are listed first and credits are listed below the debits with a slight indention. Okay, when we incur labor, we want to record a payable to show that there is an amount owed to our employees. We will credit or increase our payable count for salaries and wage payable. And we know since it's a liability because it's a payable, we'll increase it with a credit on the right side. And we'll apply that labor that the employees have incurred, the labor costs, to the departments in which those employees have worked. And they will be offset with that debit. So here's our direct labor. That's our debit, and our payable is our credit. So in journal entry form, we debit our work and process accounts because they increase, and then we credit our payable. Remember, three parts to every unit cost, direct labor, direct material, and overhead. When overhead is applied, we'll credit the overhead account and apply the overhead that each department incurs with a debit to the work and process account because we want to increase work and process. And in journal entry form, we see the debits to our work in process because we've increased the cost in work in process. And we've applied overhead, and the application of overhead is a credit. Once processing has been completed in a department, the units are transferred to the next department for further processing. So naturally, when we have all of our dough mixed from the mixing department, we need to transfer that dough and all its costs to the baking department. We will credit or reduce the work and process for the mixing and we'll debit the work and process for the baking. And this shows how costs will move from one work, as work and process account to the next. And here we see the debit and credits from one department to the next. So we're increasing the cost to our baking and we're decreasing the cost from mixing. We're just transferring the cost from mixing to baking. Finally, when goods are finally completed, we can move the cost of those goods from that last department, which is our baking department, into the finished goods account. And I like to call this our warehouse account because it signifies that everything is done and nothing else will be done in terms of labor, materials, or overhead. We'll increase the finished goods account with a debit because it's still an asset and we'll reduce the work and process from our last department which was the baking department with a credit. When we sell our product to the customer, we can move the goods from our warehouse account or that finished goods account into an expense account called cost of goods sold. And this expense account will be on our income statement. Cost of goods sold is increased with a debit, and our finished goods will be reduced with a credit. Let's change gears and look into a dilemma our master baker is having. He knows that he was able to get 10,000 units of muffin dough to the baking department this month. That is, he transferred 10,000 units of dough from mixing to baking. But he's got some mixed dough in the freezer that still needs some ingredients added. How many units did we mix in my department, then he asks. The dilemma is that he has an ending work and process balance for his department, but he doesn't know the cost per unit since the number of units is still unknown. Here we're introduced to the equivalent units of production. 
Equivalent units are the product of the number of partially completed units and the percentage completion of those units, just the multiplication. The product of our muffin in this little picture here is that we have one muffin. And we're going to multiply that by the percentage of completion of our, our muffin, which is 50%. So we have half a muffin. If we have multiple incomplete units, we could theoretically combine all of those incomplete units into full units. If 10,000 units are 70% complete, that is equivalent to 7,000 complete units. We need a way to divide our cost in units even though they may not be fully complete. For the current period, Jones started 15,000 units and completed 10,000 units, leaving 5,000 units in process at 30% complete. How many equivalent units of production did Jones have for the period? The key is that we are talking about how many units were actually produced. We know for sure that we completed 10,000 but we need to apply an equivalent unit to the remainder of units in the work in process. So in addition to the completed units, we'll have 1,500 equivalent units, which is 5,000 units times 30%. That's that amount remaining in work in process and we added that to the 10,000 units that were com fully completed. There are different methods for equivalent units of production, but let's just stay focused on the weighted average method. This way we will make no distinction between work done in a prior or current period. We'll blend together the units and the cost from prior and current periods, and we will determine equivalent units of production for a department by adding together the number of units transferred out plus the equivalent units in the ending work and process. We are computing equivalent units of production. We keep material cost and conversion cost as single elements. Conversion costs, if you remember, are labor and manufacturing overhead that is used to actually convert materials into a product. We are given the Smith Company's activity for June in the assembly department. We know the beginning work in process. We know the units that were starting to production. We know the units that were actually completed. And we know the ending balance of work in process. The main thing we care about when we are computing the equivalent units produced are the total units completed and actually transferred out. So 5,400 in this case. And then the units that are partially complete. So what is sitting in work in process? We will compute the equivalent units remaining in work in process by multiplying the ending work in process units by the percent complete. Materials was 60% complete and conversion was 30% complete. Equivalent units of production always equals those things. The units that were actually completed, which was 5,400, and then the equivalent units remaining in work in process, which we computed separately for materials and conversion. That will get us the total number of units that were produced, equivalent units. And lastly, we can then use those equivalent units that were produced to divide the total cost of production to get a cost per equivalent unit.